exoplanets, worlds beyond our solar system. Hello, and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to look at exoplanets, worlds orbiting alien stars. We're going to be joined by Dr. Thane Curry, astrophysicist at the Subaru Telescope, who recently discovered a planet nine times more massive than Jupiter, orbiting a young star a little over 500 light years from Earth. On the 21st of March, 2002, uh, NASA confirmed the 5,000th exoplanet known to astronomers, marking a milestone in our understanding of the cosmos. Now, three decades before our time, the first exoplanets were found orbiting pulsars, rapidly spinning corpses of stars during the second week in 1992. This was the week Christy Yamaguchi won the U.S. Female Figure Skating Championship, Paul Simon kicked off a tour of South Africa, and President George H.W. Bush got violently ill at the home of the Japanese Prime Minister. On the 6th of October, 1995, the day after O.J. Simpson was found innocent of murder, the ast astronomers announced the discovery of 50, 51 Pegasi, the first exoplanet found around a healthy, active, main-sequence star. Now, the planets of our own solar system come in a delightful range of styles. The innermost four of these are the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, small planets like these are the hardest to find around other stars. Still, astronomers have already found planets smaller than our own orbiting their own stellar parents. The nearest planetary system to Earth was recently found to be home to at least three worlds. The most recent of these planetary finds comes in at a mass of just one quarter that of the Earth. Now, at the other end of the scale, supermassive planets like Apia Rogai B can dwarf even mighty Jupiter. One. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Thane Curry. He is an astrophysicist at the Subaru Telescope and the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. And he's recently helped find a massive new exoplanet out there. Welcome to, welcome to the show, Thane. Good to be here. Nice. So can you tell us a little bit about your finding, about this world, um, AB or guy B, and what makes it so special? This is a bizarre object. So we think that AB or B provides evidence for a protoplanet, you know, a planet that's still in its assembly, still in the process of forming, and embedded in sort of a natal gas and dust uh, from which we think all planets form. And in particular, in particular um, it's even more bizarre than uh, the only other directly in the protoplanet system, in, in, in the sense that it appears to be located at a wide separation. So about uh, 20 times, or almost 20 times the distance between the Sun and Jupiter, somehow we find evidence for an object that we think is about nine Jupiter masses. It's still in the in process of assembly. So how did that object form? And I think that's what's really the most intriguing thing about this, about this find. Yeah, so this sounds, this sounds totally bizarre. First of all, not only the, the huge mass of the thing, but the enormous distance as well. How common could exoplanets like that be? Well, we think in general, wide separation, um, imageable planets. Uh, so these would be planets, you know, a little bit more massive than Jupiter. So, so wide separation, uh, Jupiter mass planets are very uncommon in general. They sort of form the extremes of planet formation. They're sort of atypical uh, compared to most of the 5,000 planets we've identified in the past quarter century or so. But they may be uh, very good markers for um, telling us information about the range of ways in which planets can form. 
So most of the 5,000 5, planets we've identified in the last 25 years or so uh, orbit on solar system scales. All right, so the distance between about the sun to Neptune is about 30 times the distance between the sun and the earth, so 30 astronomical units. All right, so uh, we think that we can explain these planets um, through means that are, comp are comparable to uh, the means that have been evoked to explain the planets in our own solar system. But Averiga, we think, is probably different. This, uh, we think that it provides evidence for an alternate theory for uh, the formation of uh, gas giant planets, namely uh, one that is called disk instability. And so what is it that, what is this disk instability that caused this weird planet to form? Sure, so to sort of back up first, uh, I need, should probably explain uh, what the sort of canonical model for uh, forming yes. Jupiter-like planets is. So the canonical model is sort of a ground-up model. It's called core accretion. And the basic idea is fairly straightforward. So you start by submicron-sized dust grains sticking together into pebbles and eventually into boulder-sized objects and then into large planet mass objects. Now, if you have a um, core, you have a planet mass core that gets to be several times the mass of the Earth, it is possible that it can start then to uh, accrete gas uh, around it. So the gas that, that is uh, in the uh, disk of gas, you know, the gas and dust from which this planet is, 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 being, is, is emerging. Um, so then that core accretes that gas, you know, so hence the name core accretion. Um, but this alternate model is fundamentally different. This is a top-down model for planet formation called disk instability. The basic idea is that if that disk is so massive and if it can cool efficiently, uh, then that you can actually have regions of that disk fragment break up and then collapse under their own self-gravity. So instead of having this sort of slow ground up process that will maybe take a few million years or so to run to completion, uh, if it can work at all, uh, you have this sort of top down process that can, can actually run, um, it can actually give you a planet mass object in, in the span of maybe tens of thousands of years. So much faster. That is fast, that's, that's incredible, especially for a planet that size. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, there are, we've just recently passed 5,000 confirmed exoplanets out there. What attracted you to look at this one particular system? Actually, the original choice to target this particular star was purely an accident. It was a last minute decision. We were, we actually had focused our planet imaging instrument on the Subaru telescope called SCEXIO, which stands for Subaru Chronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics Project. That's a mouthful. Uh, it, it, it is a mouthful. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's much better just to go by the acronym. But we, we had focused our planet imaging instrument on a different star, you know, a very faint star. And unfortunately, uh, our instrument was having trouble functioning on that very faint star. It, you know, it's much tougher to correct for atmospheric turbulence if the star is faint, fewer photons. Um, you know, nature makes things hard sometimes. So I had to make a snap decision on what to observe instead. And just the first thing that popped in my head was Aviariga. And the only reason I decided to go there is, is that, you know, we knew that there would be something interesting, um, or at least something aesthetically interesting by targeting this system. It had a very massive disk, it had a lot of structure, it had a lot of spiral arms, it sort of looks like a, almost like a mini galaxy. So we knew, it'd be, we would, knew we would get a detection, didn't know what we would do with that information, but couldn't think of anything else at the time. And so we got a little bit more than we bargained for. What else do we know about that system, or is this pretty much just somebody just found that it has this great spiral structure, and then you look closer? So Abiariga is one of uh, the better known um, planet forming systems. Uh, in, in the star and planet formation uh, community. So you know, if you talk to other experts in uh, star and planet formation, a lot of them will know the star by name. Um, it is about a 2.4 solar mass star in the Taurus Auriga star forming region, which is one of our key benchmarks for understanding how, uh, how stars form and understanding the earliest stages of planet formation. It's probably about 2 million years old or so, give or take a few million years. So this is a very young system. Yeah, right. we're, probing, we're probing really, uh, in the same complex, you still have molecular 
clouds, you know, emission left over. So this is still like in the very earliest stages of star, of star and planet formation. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a very important region. And so Abiriga has been targeted uh, for quite a long time. Uh, I think even the first Hubble Space Telescope data for Abiriga dated from 1999. That gives you a sense of how long we've been thinking about the system. As, a, uh, as one that will give us useful information about, uh, about the planet formation process. It was only until very recently with our, inst with our instrument on Subaru and then through digging, old, digging through some old Hubble data and taking new data, they were actually able to shed new light on this system. That's fascinating. And of course, next great instrument is James Webb Space Telescope. What can, what can that help teach us about about exoplanets in the near future? Sure, so, so I'll start by talking about how it might help us understand Aviariga and then sort of expand yeah, uh, beyond do. that. So sort of in general, um, some of the, the best ground-based uh, planet imaging instruments um, on the best sites on the Earth can probably do a little bit better than, than James Webb Space Telescope can for imaging planets really close to the star. But for very wide separation planets, um, James Webb starts to have an, a significant advantage. Uh, if, for no other reason than it's a six and a half meter telescope in space. Right? So you don't have to have an atmosphere to deal with. And especially means that if you're looking at longer wavelengths uh, than we typically look, um, you don't have to deal with uh, background emission from, um, from the atmosphere like you do even on the best sites uh, on, on the Earth. So what it will help us understand with Averiga, it might help us identify additional protoplanets. So maybe planets that are still uh, embedded in the disk, maybe but extincted by, um, you know, gas and by gas and especially dust in 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 the way. It might help reveal those cocooned planets a little bit more a little bit more easily. Uh, but it'll also be very good for uh, imaging wide separation planets around some of the nearest stars, around systems that are maybe a lot older than Abiriga. So maybe uh, stars that are a few hundreds of millions of years old, sort of like adolescent planetary systems, if you kind of want to think about it that way. Uh, so it'd be very useful that way. It's, ni it's a nice complement to what we can do on the ground. That, that is fabulous. So you must mean, obviously, you know, this is a recent discovery for you, but you must have some vision of what this, what this planet would be like. What do, you, um, what do you imagine? Are there, are there many moons? Are, is there heating going on? What's, what's your vision? Yeah, I, I, th I think that's one of the fun things about a discovery like this because we know that it exists. It, it we know that what we, what we found provides pretty, pretty strong evidence for a planet in the process of forming. But a lot of the details are very murky. So if you would like try, if you ask me if I could draw, you know, like, like if, I, if I were an artist, could I, if I could draw what is actually happening uh, in you know, in in this uh, in this region that we call uh, Abiriga, it'd actually be very hard to come up with a conclusive answer because there are a lot of different models for how we think um, the emission might be uh, might be re might be causing uh, you know, the light that we that we can see. Right, so it could be that we have this protoplanet that's surrounded by a spherical envelope of material. Uh, it could be that it's secreting uh, gas uh, through through a magnetosphere, sort of like the way in which stars accrete uh, material from a, from a circumstellar disk. There are a lot of unknown things about that, including that it could be the case that uh, there is a circumplanetary, a circumplanetary disk around this, uh, around this object, sort of its own little mini solar system. Uh, we don't know the answers to those questions quite yet, and the data is sort of unconstrained, but perhaps with future observations of the ground, you know, Mauna Kea or in, in Chile, or in space with the James Webb Space Telescope, perhaps we can start to answer those questions. That's great. And finally, what's next for you? Are, we, are you going to continue to study this system in this world? Or are you going to set your sights somewhere else? So we're focusing on a couple of different uh, directions. So one, I do want to uh, understand Abiriga in a little bit more detail. And that means looking um, at the protoplanet at shorter wavelengths, so in th into the optical wavelengths. We think that might be able to tell us a little bit more about the uh, range of different emission sources that responsible for, for what we are able to see. Perhaps give us uh, a little bit more convincing evidence uh, this object is accreting, you know, basically that it's still growing. Uh, we don't know quite the answer to that conclusively yet, but maybe future observations will tell us. 
I think also we're really interested in looking for other systems uh, that may be uh, maybe not so much siblings, but probe comparable states of development uh, as uh, this protoplanet around Aviriga. So this would be focusing on imaging uh, protoplanets around other stars, maybe stars that are less massive than Aviriga, maybe stars that are, um, you know, that can help us identify planets on more solar system-like scales. So those are things that I'm interested in doing right now. That's fabulous. Thanks so much for being on the show, Thane. It was fabulous talking with you. Thank you. Thanks. And that was Thane Curry, astrophysicist at Subaru Telescope and National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. One odd class of exoplanets are super Neptunes. Now, just as name suggests, these are planets similar to for larger versions of Neptune or Uranus, having roughly five to seven times as much mass as Earth. These appear to be common in other solar systems, yet they do not exist, as far as we know, within our own family of planets. Now, perhaps the most intriguing of all exoplanets are super-Earths. These worlds are slightly larger than our home planet, and some are found at just the right distances from their suns that liquid water, and perhaps even life, might take root on the surfaces of these worlds. Now, uh, along with the ocean worlds of our solar system, exoplanets orbiting within the Goldilocks zone, where it's neither too cold nor too hot, may offer us our best hope of finding life beyond the Earth. In 1999, researchers spotted an exoplanet passing in front of its star as seen from Earth. This means of detecting worlds around other stars, called the transit method, notched up its first of many victories. The Kepler spacecraft launched in March 2009. Following the loss of stabilizing gyros, the Kepler team extended the mission in 2014 using pressure from sunlight to help orient the observatory, kicking off the K2 mission. This prolific planet hunter discovered over 3,200 planets before finally falling silent in 2018. Nearly all of these Kepler discoveries were found using the transit method. Exoplanets have been found orbiting multiple star systems and the first exoplanet in the so-called habitable zone or Goldilocks zone of its star was found in 2001. The Spitzer Space Telescope launched two years later examining the atmospheres of distant worlds. Now, astronomers can learn a lot of details of the, about the atmospheres of exoplanets by examining light coming through these atmospheres, uh, a task first, com com uh, first completed in 2007. Seven years later, the first Earth-sized world within its star's Goldilocks zone was discovered using the Kepler Observatory. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Now we took our first look at our next door neighbors in 2016 with the discovery of the first of three worlds now known to orbit Proxima Centauri, the star closest to the sun. In February of 2017, Black Sabbath played their final concert, 
Adele won a pair of Grammys for Hello in 25, and the search for exoplanets hit a jackpot as NASA announced the discovery of seven intriguing exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system just 40 light years from Earth. Jackpot. The TESS spacecraft lifted off in April of 2018, searching for telltale dips in brightness caused as planets pass within our line of sight in front of their stars. In the last couple of years, researchers have found not just exoplanets, but also exomoons racing around these t distant worlds. Following monumental successes with Kepler, Spitzer, and TESS, the, Japanese, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope promises to unlock some of the greatest mysteries in the universe. By peering through the atmospheres of exoplanets, the JWST could soon find the first evidence of life on other worlds. Why, hello there. This discovery will likely come as astronomers detect atmospheres loaded with the telltale markers of life. Now, as Carl Sagan was fond of saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and vigorous debate not to mention nonsensical rantings on the internet, will be heard around the world. However, finding life on other worlds will mark a historic milestone on our path toward becoming an interplanetary species, changing the human race forever. Join us starting on the 3rd of May when we talk about water worlds of the cosmos, we will be joined by oceanographer Sylvia Earle, former chief scientist of NOAA and Time Magazine's first hero of the planet. Visit the Cosmic Companion anywhere online. Man, oh manity, it is going to be a great show. Please subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends. And visit us anytime at the Cosmic Companion anywhere. See you soon. Meow.